1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 29 through 34. We are continuing the discussion on the belief of the resurrection of the dead and Paul's argument against those who said there is no such thing. Now, verse 29, he's going to give one reason. And in verses 31, 32, 30, 31, 32, he's going to give a second reason. And then he's going to sum up the entire chapter in verses 33 and 34 so far about belief in the resurrection of the dead or not believing in the resurrection of the dead and challenge the Corinthians as well as ourselves. So verse 29, otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? We probably shouldn't concentrate too much about what's this baptism for the dead mean? People are still puzzled by it today. Commentators have all kinds of different answers for that. And I think the best thing we can do is note that Paul doesn't approve of this practice and he doesn't disapprove of this practice. He just merely notes it and says, if this is going on, what's the reason if there's no resurrection for the dead? Meaning there must be a resurrection for the dead. Okay, for the next uh, argument he gives in chapter, or excuse me, verse 30, why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride and you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? Now Paul's saying, all the trials and tribulations I've gone through, I've been pretty foolish if there's no resurrection for, of the dead. And he talks about if I fought with beasts at Ephesus. I think he's speaking hypothetically here. You may recall in Acts chapter 19, the, um, the riot that occurred in Ephesus, and Paul was in danger of being torn to pieces by furious men. So that's probably what he means by beast at, at Ephesus. <clears throat> and, um, and so if, if the dead are not raised, then he says, we might as well eat and drink and be merry because tomorrow we're going to die. Well, that's kind of, uh, he's saying that ironically. Okay, and now for the challenge. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. The believers were keeping bad company. They were listening to people who said there was no resurrection of the dead. And they were in danger of falling, you know, falling along with them. But Jesus himself told the Sadducees in um, Matthew 22, verse 29, and the Sadducees, if you remember, in verse 23, it says, it tells us a little bit about them. Matthew 22, verse 23. The same day Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And then we jump down to 29. But Jesus answered them, you are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So to say there is no resurrection of the dead is to proclaim utter ignorance of God. So... Now, back to bad company. Now, we have either experienced this, or we know of it, or we have seen it, but we know that bad company corrupts. Now, how do they do that? Well, they usually attack the foundations of virtue and urge the overthrow of the restraints of vice. And that appeals to our baser and selfish side of our human nature. We are more easily swayed to do the wrong thing than to do the right. And once we are persuaded to do that, then we rationalize it and start proclaiming or saying, well, this is the right thing to do, not the other stuff. So what can we do? We cannot avoid encountering bad people here or, or evil people in this world. But there are some, some things we can do. One, we can avoid friendship with them. Two, we might be protected from their influence. And three, we could be a corrective influence on them. So of these three, the Christian is best equipped and actually called to be a correcting influence. Here you recall that we are the salt and light of the earth. So our challenge is to remind ourselves of the fact that we have a job to do and also that God has equipped us. And some of that equipping is called the armor of God. And I would challenge you to read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. That gives a description of the armor of God. And we also know that we cannot be separated from the love of God. 
And there's a good description of that in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. So our takeaway is Ephesians 5, excuse me, Ephesians 6, the armor of God, and Romans 8, the love of God. Thanks for watching today. I hope this has been an inspiration to you.